Welcome to the first video in our Digital Acumen series. In this series, we will be focusing on using digital tools to assist us with various tasks as management accountants. In this video, we will be looking at how to perform and interpret multiple regression analysis in Microsoft Excel. You may recall that we covered regression analysis with a single independent variable in our series on cost estimation and behavior. In this video, we will extend those principles to performing multiple regression analysis and focusing more on the interpretation of the additional statistics rather than just the variable coefficients. Let us consider our learning objectives for this video. First, we will review what regression analysis is. We will then understand the difference between the regression analysis we covered in our series on cost estimation and behavior and multiple regression analysis. We will then use an example to show how to perform multiple regression analysis in Excel. And finally, we will perform a detailed interpretation of the regression statistics. So what is regression analysis? Regression is a statistical technique to determine the blind that best fits the various data points we have observed. So how does regression identify this line? Basically, the method is based on the principle of minimizing the sum of the squares of the vertical deviations between the line that is estimated and the actual data points. The line of best fit has the smallest sum of squares of vertical deviations compared to any other line that is drawn. So what is the difference between the single variable regression analysis we previously looked at in our series on cost estimation and behavior and multiple regression analysis? It is very simple. Single variable regression analysis only has one independent or explanatory variable. In our equation on screen, you will see only one x with one b representing the coefficient to that x. Multiple regression analysis, on the other hand, has more than one independent variable. If we look at the equation, you can see that we have multiple x's representing our independent variables and multiple b's representing their coefficients. So, a in the equation will represent our non-variable costs. B1 will represent the average cost change in Y because of a one unit change in our variable X1, assuming that all other X variables remain constant. Likewise, B2 will represent the average cost change in Y because of a one unit change in our independent variable X2 assuming that all other variables remain constant, and so forth. Now let us learn how to perform the regression analysis in Excel. To do so, we will use an example. Notice in this example that we have one dependent or Y variable being our maintenance costs, and we have two independent or X variables being machine hours and units produced. Now, let us move over to Excel to perform this example. Okay, so here we have the example in Excel, and let's see how we're going to perform it. Firstly, we want to go across to the data ribbon. We then find the analyze tab, and we should have a button for data analysis. If we don't have this button, like I don't currently have it here, what we need to do is we need to go to the file, then we go to options, in this menu on the left hand side of the screen, we click on add ins. We then go to manage our add ins. We select Excel add ins and we click go. Then we get an option of add ins that we can add and we want to add in the analysis tool pack. So we tick the analysis tool pack and we select OK. Now you will see my data ribbon has updated under the an Analyze tab, I now have Data Analysis. We now click on the Data Analysis, and under the Analyze Tools, we scroll down and select Regression. We then click OK. We now need to input the required ranges of our X and Y variables under the Input section over here. To do so, we'll start with our Y range, which is our dependent variable, 
So we click on the arrow here and then we highlight our maintenance costs or our Y variable. We click on the little down arrow here to return to the previous screen. We now do the same for our X variables. Our X variables, remember, represent our independent variables. So we select the arrow and notice what we do here is we select multiple columns. Each column will represent a different independent or X variable. We again return to the previous screen by clicking on this little down arrow here. The default confidence interval is then 95%. This is the usual confidence level, so we can leave it as is. For our output option, we can select new worksheet. And if you want, you can give it a name. For now, we'll leave it nameless. We then select OK, and a new sheet will be created with our output results. Now that we have our regression results, we see that there are three sections. The top section shows our overall regression statistics, and the second section is titled ANOVA, which stands for Analysis of Variance. These two sections speak to our overall model fit. The third section then lists our variables with a whole bunch of statistics next to them. These statistics relate to the individual variables in our model. Now let us unpack the important statistics in a bit more detail. First, we have our R squared. The R squared shows the amount of variance of Y explained by our X variables. In this case, how much do machine hours and units produced explain our maintenance costs? Based on the R squared number, we see that machine hours and units produced explain 87.54% of the variation in maintenance costs. The R squared, however, doesn't account for the number of variables or number of observations used in the regression model. As such, we then get the adjusted R-squared, which is interpreted in the same way as the R-squared, but it is a more realistic measure and therefore a better measure than the R-squared. So in this example, machine hours and units produced explain 84.77% of the variation in maintenance costs. This is a very good proportion of explanation. Next, we then have the standard error. Similar to the R squared measures, this also measures how accurately the regression model fits the data. The closer the number is to zero, the better. Next, we have the number of observations. This simply represents the number of cases used to build the model. In this example, we only use 12 observations, which is very small. Small sample sizes can be problematic, and they may not provide accurate results. We would also need to confirm if the sample is suitably representative of the population as a whole. Moving on to the ANOVA section, we begin with our degrees of freedom. Our degrees of freedom are related to our observations and number of variables in the model. You will notice that the total degrees of freedom is 11, which is one less than the number of observations. This is because the model as a whole uses up one observation. Each variable in the model then uses up a degree of freedom as well. We had two variables in the model being machine hours and units produced. So the regression uses two degrees of freedom. This leaves us with nine degrees of freedom for the residual. The more degrees of freedom we have, the better. Next, we look at the F statistic, and more importantly, the significance of the F. This shows whether the model as a whole is significant. Specifically, it tests whether the R squared is different from zero. In order for our model to be significant, we want the R squared to be different from zero. At a 95% confidence, we would expect the significance of F to be less than 0.05. In this example, it is less than 0.05, so the overall model is significant. We then move on to our variable statistics. First up, we have the coefficients. These values give us our regression equation, which is detailed on screen. The coefficients also give us the direction of the relationship as either positive, 
i.e. they move in the same direction, or negative, i.e. they move in opposite directions. Finally, they provide us with the magnitude of the change for a unit change of the independent variable. So here we see that our variable x1, or machine hours, has a positive relationship with maintenance costs, while our variable x2, units produced, has a negative relationship. We also see that the magnitude of the change from our machine hours is much greater than that of the units produced. Now it is very strange that units produced has a negative relationship. We would expect more units produced to be related to more maintenance costs. This is where our next set of stats comes in. The t-stat tests the hypothesis that the coefficient is different from zero. It needs to be compared to the appropriate t-value at the required confidence interval. So for a 95% confidence, the t-value needs to be greater than 1.96. A much easier statistic to interpret is the p-value. This is a two-tailed test of whether each coefficient is different from zero. At a 95% confidence, we need the p-value to be less than 0.05. Based on this, we can see that our machine hours does have explanatory power, as the p-value is 0.03, which is less than 0.05. However, neither the intercept nor units produced are statistically significant, as their p-values are greater than 0.05. At this point, it is important to remember that regression analysis shows associations or relationships between variables. We must not confuse association with causation. So in conclusion, our model of maintenance costs explains 84% of the variability of maintenance costs, which is excellent. The model as a whole is statistically significant, seen from the significance of the F stat, which is less than 0.05. This is also good for us. And finally, machine hours shows a positive statistically significant relationship with maintenance cost. For each additional machine hour, the maintenance cost will increase by 3 rand and 92 cents. However, we do need to be cautious with our model due to the small number of observations as well as the fact that we have not yet tested our underlying assumptions. Remember the underlying assumptions for linear regression, which are now listed on screen. The first is linearity, which is that the independent variables should have a linear relationship with the dependent variables. The second is no multicollinearity, meaning that the independent variables should not be related to each other. The third is that the error must not be heteroscedastic, which means that the variance of the residuals should remain constant. Fourth is that the errors should not be correlated with each other. And finally, the error residual must be normally distributed. That brings us to the end of our first video in our digital acumen series. See you next time.